How many of you would consider yourself a risk taker? Okay. You like, and in, in some, depending on like the defini definition of risk taker, but you, you may be a person who you're like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm willing to try new things. How many of you, you don't mind trying new things? Whether it's food or people or experiences. Um, how many of you would say you're not risk takers? You like to have things figured out. You like to evaluate and consider all the options and okay, yeah, yeah. So there and and there are is everything in between as well. It's like, oh well, in some things I'm willing to be a risk taker, in and other things I'm not. Now, what are some things that uh, a risk that you take? Like it's it's called a calculated risk. All right, what's a calculated risk you have taken where it's risky? Maybe people watching it like you're like, oh well, that was a risk, but. You had calculated it, and you, you figured it out, and it was worth the risk. It was worth, you, you know, you figured, like, it was a manageable risk. What's something that you've experienced, a risk that you've taken that was a calculated risk? Autumn. Homework. Okay, procrastinating on homework, doing it later. So you've calculated, all right, I still have 36 minutes before class but I know it's only 35 minutes of homework. And you've, counted, you've worked it out, you know, it's, it's risky to leave it because, you know, what if you, you know, fall in the toilet in the bathroom and are delayed 30 seconds. But, okay, what's another risk, a calculated risk you've taken? Okay, wait again, waiting on, on homework and, and having to get it done, what else? <laughs> not not practicing guitar before you. So you've calculated, ah, I know this. I'll be able to remember it, which as a fellow musician, I can say has betrayed me on more than one occasion. And it turns out I didn't calculate it as well as I thought it would. Zach. Okay. How was that a calculated risk? Okay, but you calculated, oh, I'll be able to get them all done on Saturday, but you paid the price by having to do them all on Saturday. Mackenzie. Not taking medicine, Not taking medicine because you figure, eh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger <laughs> or maims you for life. <laughs> okay, Emma. Not studying for a test because, oh, okay, I can do this. I, yeah, so all of those can be calculated risks where you figure, I can manage this. I know what I'm doing. I, I'll remember it or I'll, I'll be able to get it all done in time. And then one of the calculated risks that, that I was just thinking about was asking a girl out. <laughs> Wait, you don't think I could ever ask a girl out? So I, it was this calculated risk like, okay. I know her name. Good to go, all right? Um, or, hey, so, all right, I'm gonna ask her out, you know, and sometimes you weigh the consequences. Like, all right, it's a calculated risk. It's risky to ask her out, but I mean, what, what's the worst that could happen? You know, it, she's not a praying mantis. She's not gonna bite my head off. Right, and so it's this calculated risk where you feel like, oh, I can handle this, I can, I, I can do this, and things are gonna work out, it's gonna be fine. But what is a risk you have taken because of your faith in God? Anybody? Where you felt like God was opening a door for you or leading you to something and you didn't have it all figured out. You couldn't calculate all the risk, you couldn't make it simple, but you, you, in your faith in God, you believe that God was going to carry you through it. Ariel, going on a mission trip, okay? Yeah, you can't, you cannot figure out everything that's going to happen on a mission trip. And in fact, if you think you can, come on a mission trip. <laughs> okay, Taya, going up and praying for somebody, yeah. I mean, you don't know what their response is going to be. You don't know what God's response is going to be. You don't know how God's going to move in your prayer and how, and how he's going to respond, what you're going to do. Carter. Leading worship. Leading worship. Why? Okay, for sure. There's all kinds of intangibles like that. Oh.
Oh, asking, asking somebody who's not a Christian to help fund your mission trip. And yeah, you don't know what their response is going to be. You don't know how, how, how that's going to turn out. But yet you step out simply because you believe it's what God has called you to do. And it brings us back to what we were just singing about and what we were talking about, like, you're bigger than I thought you were. When we, are, when we step out in faith, we are actually volunteering to be uncomfortable. When we step out in faith, we're actually acknowledging, you know what, I don't have this all figured out, and you know what, I'm okay with it. Well, I might not feel okay with it, but I am willing to trust in who God is. I'm willing to believe that God can do more with this situation than I can do with this situation. You ever been in one of those situations? Okay, all of us in some way are gonna be there, but we have the choice of going, okay, am I gonna step out possibly be uncomfortable believing that what God has for me is going to be good. And so I saw this, uh, this shirt a while back. It said, get comfortable, get comfortable being uncomfortable. And it was a workout shirt. It was, it was meant to be inspiring, like, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Go, you know, lift, eh, right? But I looked at it and I totally went, that is absolutely a biblical concept. It's absolutely a God concept because God will call us into things that are going to bring us life. He will not necessarily only call us into things that will make us comfortable. So how comfortable are you being uncomfortable? Now, you may sit here this morning or in your life, your temperament may be, I don't wanna be uncomfortable. Nope, I mean, in the US, we seek comfort in everything, don't we? I mean, we don't have to be very uncomfortable in a lot. And we experience some of this when we go to mi on mission trips to other places and you're like, you sleep where? But how comfortable are you being uncomfortable? And if in our heart, if our soul is not willing to be uncomfortable, we're gonna struggle with this whole idea of God being bigger than we thought he was because, man, I don't want God to be bigger than I think he is. I want God to be exactly my size. I'm okay with God being me plus a little bit. I'm a nice person. God's a little nicer. I'm a kind person. God's a little kinder. I'm a good person. God's a little gooder, right? It's all this idea of I got to keep God manageable because I don't want to be uncomfortable. But here is a truth, and, we, and this is, you're not going to be pleased with this. You're not going to like this. I don't like it. Our comfort is, our, now where am I? What happened? What's going on? Where did I go? Hold on. Hold on. I'll get there. Our comfort is not God's priority. Oh, but God, I thought you loved me. I do love you, Right? But we attach our comfort, we attach God's love together, and we figure that, oh, well, if God loves me, he must want me to be comfortable. Therefore, God would never ask me to get up in front of people and do something that I'm uncomfortable doing. God would never ask me to go to some place where I'm not going to feel like just I'm at home and it's easy. God would never ask me to go talk to somebody or to go pray for somebody where it might get awkward or it might, it might not be clear why, I was, why he was asking me to do that. But this is a reality with God, that our comfort is not God's priority. Life is God's priority. And what he leads us to, he promises will lead us to life. Do you believe that? Hello? Hello? Now, for some of you, right now, you could be like, yeah, and you're just sitting there quietly to make me look dumb. Some of you, I say, do you believe that God wants to bring you life? And maybe right now what you're feeling is, I don't know, it doesn't feel like I've received very much life. It doesn't feel like I've heard very much from God. And that's a tough place to be. It is. Been there. 
But our comfort is not God's priority, but if it's our priority, that's what we're going to seek. And as long as we are seeking our own comfort, we're going to have a hard time hearing from God. Because it means we're only going to be listening for or looking for the stuff that's comfortable, the stuff that's easy, the stuff that we agree with. And that's how we make God much smaller. And that's why we may never find out that he's bigger than we thought he was. We got to wrestle with that. But how comfortable are you being, how comfortable are you with being uncomfortable? Because that's a way that God will want to stretch our faith. How many of you have ever moved? Okay, you moved neighborhoods, moved houses, moved schools. What are some of the common factors that everybody experiences when they move, when they, when they make a change? Okay, what's something that, that's just kind of common? Not knowing the people around you. Not knowing the people around you. Zach? Stress. Stress. Like, oh, and that can be from all kinds of reasons. Worry, is this going to work out? Is this what I need? Is this, Jared? Com- changing your surroundings? I remember the first night in our new house. Hey, I'm a full-grown adult almost. And I was like, uh, where, where are the dishes? <laughs> I just want a bowl. <laughs> and not having a Carter. Uh, being tired. Being tired. Okay, when you move, it's just a lot of work and change and, and all that. Brent, trying, trying not to get lost, knowing, knowing where you are. There's new rules, there's new people. One more. Confusion. Confusion. Just what is, is going on and, and what's happening now. We've been in this series before Christmas through Genesis, and we went through the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And... Here's what we saw. God, in the beginning, what? God. In the beginning, God. So that established everything. In the beginning, God created. He created the heavens, the earth, light and dark, land and sea, air and sky, all, all of these things. And then he created all the animals. And he wasn't done. He was like, no, no, I'm not done yet. And so he creates man. Still not done, so he creates woman, a a companion for man. So man and woman come together. They were designed together. They were designed to complement one another. They're they're here for, for, for one another. And then Adam and Eve buy into the lie that they want to be enlightened. Man, we live in a culture that thinks it wants to be enlightened, don't we? That, oh, we can decide what is right and wrong. We can decide what is natural and unnatural. We can decide what we should be able to do and and all these things. And so Adam and Eve ate what God told them not to eat, and their eyes were opened. Their eyes were open to the reality that they were no longer in God's will, and they felt shame. Shame was not part of God's original design. The shame that we experience in our life when we live against God is not where God wants you to live. So they were separated from God. They had some kids, Cain and Abel. Cain looked at Abel, was jealous because God accepted Abel's offerings because Abel was was seeking God, and God was saying, here's what I'm, I'm asking of you, or I'm, I'm demanding of you, and Abel said, this is what I want to give you. Okay, I'm, I'm going to give you what you want. Cain, like us, decided he should be the one who decides what God cares about. He should be able to decide what to offer to God, and God should like it. And when God didn't, it broke Cain's heart. And because like us. We don't like to accept blame. We don't like to have to answer to a higher authority. He, he shoved it off, and he made it Abel's fault. And so he goes, and he kills Abel. And generation after generation after generation turn against God until finally God says, you know what? We're starting over. Ah, except for Noah and his family. They are people that are seeking after me. They're not perfect. They haven't figured it all out, but their heart is for me. And everyone else, everything they think and do is evil and against me. And so 
there was the flood. And God starts all over with Noah's family desiring relationship with people. But Noah's descendants made a mess of everything too, and pretty soon they decided, hey, you know what? We can be as powerful as God. Look at us. Look at how complex we are. We've learned how to make bricks. We've learned how to build stuff. Look at how amazing we are. We don't need this God. We're good enough on our own, and they build this tower to prove it. And God is watching this happen and going, really? Try doing it in different languages. And he confused their language. And it scattered people all over the world, which was the thing that people were afraid of. No, 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 we got to stay at home. We got to stay comfortable. We got to stay with what we know. Anybody ever feel that way? We got to stay with what we know. We got to stay with what we can manage. We, can, we got to stay with the calculated risk. We've got to stay with what we can figure out. And people were scattered all over the place. But God desired to start a new work. God's desire has never been for us to be separated. God's desire has never been for us to go it alone. But he's going to call us to things where we're going to have to trust in him or we're going to be all alone. And we're introduced to this guy named Abram. Now, Abram's family is from a place called Ur of the Chaldeans. Sounds like a pretty majestic place. Where are you from? Ur of the Chaldeans. Or it's like a, a trailer for a movie. Abram, Ur of the Chaldeans. Anyway. Um, and then his father moved to Haran and settled the family there. And that's where we're going to pick up this story. Now, it is important, please hear me. It is important not to just mind-numbingly read the Bible. Trust me, I know there are parts of the Bible that, are, that feel a little mind-numbing. and like, I don't want to think about this. I don't want to figure this out. But when you read the Bible, you will get so much more out of it if you ask questions, if you go, wait a minute, why? Or if you're willing to call it on me like, that doesn't make sense. Why did that happen? Because the Bible will speak to it. Don't worry, you're not going to outthink the Bible. You're not going to ask a question that the Bible isn't able to address or something God didn't think of. And So here's what, here's what I want to, I'm going to read you nine verses. All right, stick with me for nine verses. It's not super long. Nine verses, but here's, here's what I want you to be considered. Um, what makes a common move? What makes, what, what are some things in here that are uncommon and what are we supposed to learn about this? Why is this in the Bible? When you're reading the Bible, you should ask that a lot. Why is this in the Bible? It's the story of Jonah getting swallowed by a big fish just for me to imagine some dude becoming human sushi. I mean, what is that really all that that's in there for? Or is there something that God wants to teach us? So as I read this, you can read along. The verses are going to be up here on the screen. As we read this, think about it. Why, why is it? What are we supposed to learn from this? What is God showing us? So here we go. The Lord said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family and go to the land that I'll show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife, Sarai, his nephew, Lot, and all his wealth, his livestock, and all the people he had taken into his household at Haran, and headed for the land of Canaan. When they arrived in Canaan, Abram traveled through the land as far as Shechem. There he set up camp beside the Oak of Moreh. At that time, the area was inhabited by Canaanites. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your descendants. And Abram built an altar there and dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. After that, Abram traveled south and set up camp in the hill country with Bethel to the west and Ai to the east. There he built another altar and dedicated it to the Lord and he worshiped the Lord. Then Abram continued traveling south by stages toward the Negev. Now, 
What did God tell Abram to do? Back in the beginning of this, what did he tell it? What was the first thing he told Abram to do? What did he tell him to do? Leave your native country. So he tells him, I want you to move. Now, I'm sure at your age, you were told you were moving. You weren't asked if you, were, if you wanted to move. You were told this is going to happen. All right? What did that feel like? Anybody? Okay. Great. Awesome. Couldn't wait. Or, oh gosh, what's this going to be like? Probably all of it. Right? So he, God tells Abram, hey, Leave. Leave your country, your relatives, your father's family, all, all, everything that made him solid, God says, leave. Here's the address that I want you to go to. Okay, you can use Waze or Google Maps or anything, and it will be easy for you to find it. It's right here. This is the exact location I want you to go to. That's what he told him, right? Is that what he told him? What did he tell him? Leave your country and go where? The land that I will show you. This is, this is a story right now where we're going to see God talking a lot about the future. He's talking a lot about promises that have not come true yet. Anybody here, you are experiencing things that have not finished you are experiencing things that, that you don't know how it's going to end up. You don't know where it's going to end. You don't know whether it's going to end the way you want it to or if it's going to be different. God doesn't even tell Abram where he's going. He says, Abram, I want you to leave. Abram goes, where am I going, God? He goes, don't worry, I'll let you know. Just start walking. How into that would you be? Now, could be that this is pretty cool because, I mean, God is speaking to you. And we could get into this thing as like, oh, well, if God spoke to me that way, I would have no problem. I would just go. Right. The Bible is full of people that God spoke to directly. You know, Moses, Joshua, Aaron, Adam and Eve, Cain, Abel, who God told them directly, hey, this is who I am. This is what I want you to do. Huh? because they wanted to be comfortable. We want to be comfortable. Here, Abram is called directly by God. God says, go. It's not going to be comfortable. And Abram's got to decide what he's going to do. He has to listen for the voice of God and decide what he's going to do. You ever had somebody tell you to go look for something? And you're like, where is it? And they're like, oh, I don't know. Just look around right? That feels great, right? Or my Grammy was, was notorious for asking me to go get the red thing out of the drawer. What's a red thing? Oh, you'll see it. Okay. You walk in and you open the drawer and there's like 17 red things in the drawer. Like, which one? Grammy, which one do you want? Oh, it's right there. Just pull out the whole drawer and bring it to Grammy. <laughs> Here, which one? Oh, no, I meant the yellow one. <laughs> That's getting something out of a drawer. There's not a whole lot of consequences for not being able to find the red thing in the drawer. This was, hey, Abram, leave everything you know. Leave everything that makes you comfortable. Because you know what? Your comfort is not my priority. Life is. And what I want to do, what I need to do, means you cannot stay in Haran. You cannot stay home. You cannot stay where you're comfortable. I need you to go. I don't know if you're already going here in your mind, but I want to encourage, I want to nudge you this way. How is God calling you to move? And it might be into something different. It might be calling you to return to something that you need to be part of, that you need to be doing. 
How comfortable are you being uncomfortable? Here, God tells Abram, look, leave everything and go where I lead you. We sing a worship song around here that says, where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will what? You guys realize how gutsy that is? You guys get that? It's so easy to say. Because the words are up on the screen. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Jesus, as long as it's not someplace uncomfortable. When you move, I'll move. Unless I'm doing something else that's really important. I will follow you as long as it's somewhere that I want to go. That's the honesty, right? Honestly, that's how we live. Where you go, I'll go. I don't know. Tell me where we're going. I do this thing with my kids in the car. They go, where are we going to go? I don't know, wherever the car takes us, right? We're hungry. All right, we're going to go get food. Where are we going? Wherever the car takes us. And they hate it. <laughs> they don't enjoy this process at all. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> but this, because their willingness to be uncomfortable, no, they just want to know what to eat. I don't blame them. I would hate being on the other end of it. I just enjoy being the torturer. <laughs> but God is not doing it to torture you. He's not doing it to make your life angsty. He's not just dangling a carrot. He is going, look, follow me and I will lead you to life. He speaks to Abram and he goes, I want you to leave all this. I know it's what you know. I know it's where you're comfortable, but will you trust me that where I'm going to lead you is going to bring you life? And man, Abram does it. He does it. He packs up the things in his house. Okay? He, he rents the biggest rider camel that they rent, and it's, they just load up. He takes the servants and takes the people in his house because it was the person, it was the head of the household's responsibility to take care of the people in the house. And so he took, it wasn't that he was trying to stay rich or, or keep all his servants or anything, but it was his responsibility. And so he was caring for those people. And he calls his nephew Lot because he loved him a lot. And he says, hey, come with me. We're going to head out. And imagine Lot, okay? Uncle Abram calls you. Hey, Abe, how's it going? Dude, pack up, we're leaving. Where are we going? Don't worry about it, God's gonna show us. <laughs> Is it gonna be far? Meet me at noon. <laughs> and he does it. Lot packs up, he shows up at Uncle Abram's house. All right, we're here. Let's go. Hold on. I have more stuff than you. So at some point, they all pack up and they head out. Now, again, I want to point this out because I think this is really important. When you're reading the Bible, you, you read about things, and you're like, is this true? Like, is this accurate? How, how can we trust the Bible? Look for details. The Bible is full of details. It tells you in all these verses, like he headed for Canaan, he arrived at Canaan through the land as far as Shechem. He set up beside the Oak of Moray. All of these are actual places. They're, and so this lends credibility to the Bible. That, okay, this isn't just some story. So I just want to in, encourage you to, to consider that. But we sing, God, where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move, I'll follow you. This is what Abram did. And then God makes some promises to Abram. He promises to bless him, right? The Lord said, leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. What could be the challenge about this being very motivating to do? There's one word in here that would make me go, uh, it, well, it's one word said several times. Look how many times God says, 
will. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous. You will be a blessing to others, and I will bless those who bless you. All of these things, none of these things have happened yet. He's not famous. He hasn't been a blessing. No one's blessed him. God is just saying, I will, I will, I will, and Abram has to decide whether he's going to believe it or not. You guys, in your life, we have the promises of God. If you have put your faith in Jesus, you are filled with the Holy Spirit of God, which means God will speak to you. God will make promises to you, but they're not necessarily going to be the promises you want him to make. And they're very likely going to be like the promises he made to Abram where he says, I will. I will be with you when you go through the death of somebody that you love. I will be with you when your girlfriend or your boyfriend breaks up with you. I will be with you when you're in need. I will be with you when you are hopeless. I will bring you peace. I will bring you joy. What are you going to do with that? What would Abram, what would have happened if Abram had said, well, hold on, I'm going to stay here in Haran at home until you make me famous, until you use me to bless people, until you have people bless me, but none of those things could happen in Haran. None of those things could happen at home. What is God, who is possibly bigger than you think he is, wanting to do in your life, but first you've got to move. First, you've got to step out in faith. What does God want to do in your life? What miraculous thing is God looking to do in Haley's life? But first, Haley's going to have to step out and go, I'm going to trust that God will. What amazing, life-giving thing does God want to do in Ruby's heart, but first it's going to mean Ruby's got to get uncomfortable. What does God want to do in Catherine's life that can never happen until she takes a step into something she's going to have to trust God with? And that can be scary. And Abram and his wife, Sarai, Abram was 75 years old when this call came in. Talk about, doesn't he just deserve to take it easy? Enjoy the golden years. You know. Man, to trust God in this? To trust God? But we can get so wrapped up in our own plan that we miss God's plan. We can get so wrapped up in what we think we need to be comfortable that we go, oh, well, I'm not going to do this anymore because that, that wasn't the way that I wanted it to be. And that, Oh, I'm not going to go do that because I don't know how that's going to turn out and I will only do what I can figure out. Basically, what you're saying is, I'm not going to do anything out of faith until I can figure God out, until I have God all figured out. Good luck with that. Because God wants to move in your life and he wants to undo the things that tie you down and hold you back. He wants to set you free. He wants to give you hope. He doesn't want you to live in fear. He doesn't want you to hold back and be like, no, 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 I can only be where I'm safe. Are you willing to trust that if God calls you someplace unsafe, he will make you safe? He will protect you. I experienced this a few, uh, a few years ago, actually for the last 15 years. I was hired at LBF as the youth pastor. So I was working with junior high and high school students. I loved it. It was awesome. It was totally what I felt like God was calling me to do. And that was in 2003. In 2007, some doors started to open where people asked me, hey, would you be willing to be one of the teaching pastors? You can still do youth, but we need you to teach upstairs sometimes. And I was, now I... I had the option. I could have gone, no, no, I'm just going to stay with youth ministry. And people probably would have been fine with that. They were, oh, okay, well, okay. But I felt like this was one of those things where God says, hey, will you trust me that I'll use you? Maybe where you're not, I mean, working with adults, teaching adults, blech, right? That's kind of how I felt. And so I stepped into teaching, and I was teaching 50% of the time, and I was in youth group 
youth ministry 50% of the time. And then after a couple years of doing that, God began to move again and he started going, hey, I wanna use you in worship up in the, the adult services. I wanna, and I was like, but you, youth, Haran, home. But I felt like God was going, will you trust me that I'll use you? So I left youth ministry. That was hard. That was leaving home. And there were people that were not happy about it. Don't ask why, but they, they were like, oh, I can't believe you left youth ministry. And then, so now I'm teaching 50% of the time and I'm leading worship 50% of the time. I'm up there and trying to be obedient to what God was calling me to do. And God was moving and God was using me and God was changing my heart and, and growing me in some areas that, that I needed to grow in. And none of it was my plan. Then God started to move again and started changing my heart where you go, you know what? I need to just be able to focus on the worship stuff and let go of the teaching things. And that's when we hired Pastor Dan to handle all the teaching and just take care of it. And so I was doing all worship, but I liked teaching. And I, I okay, God, I'm going to trust that you will. And then in 2014, some doors opened up that seemed to be pointing back to youth ministry. And there was part, not part of me, there was all of me that was like, yes, 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 I'm yes, yes, right, yeah, I, I will go right now, I will. Yeah. But then I was like, wait a minute, is that just because that's home? And I didn't wanna be back in youth ministry just because I liked the idea of moving back to Haran, where I'd know people and where it was comfortable. But man, the things that God began to reveal as I was willing to step out in, okay, I don't know how this is. Man. And I grew so much through all of the moving. Abram moves from place to place, and wherever he is, he sets up an altar to worship God. Everything hadn't come to fruition yet. Everything hadn't been revealed. But worship shouldn't just be when God comes through. All right, there, God, you've revealed everything. Worship should happen in the process of going, God, I, I trust you, and so I'm going to worship you. So how does faith impact your worship? Sometimes you may come to youth group and you're like, I'm not going to worship because my life stinks. I'm not going to worship because I had a bad day. I'm not going to worship because I didn't get what I wanted. All understandable. We've all been there. We all get it. But what about worshiping because God is worthy? What about worshiping out of faith that God will? God promised Abram some ridiculous things. I will make you the father of many nations. He and Sarai didn't even have kids. She couldn't have kids. Her whole life, she's, she's 90 years old now, and she still hasn't had any kids. She's not going to have any kids, but God promised. So they continued to worship, and they continued to step out in faith. You guys, what is God calling you to step out in? Are you comfortable being uncomfortable? It doesn't mean it'll feel good. It doesn't mean you're going to figure it all out. But man, what does God want to do? What if God is bigger than you thought he was? What if he wants to do stuff in ways that don't make sense to you? So God, I pray for each person in here. God, we are all in a place where we have to trust you. Help us to make that decision. God, help us in our unbelief. Help us in the areas of our, of our heart where we are very feeling-based. We are very much, I need to see it, I need to feel it, I need to touch it, I need it to be secure. So God, right now, I pray for each person, all of us, as we step out into our lives, that we wouldn't just depend on our ability to figure it out, that we would be able to trust you, that we'd be willing to trust you, and Lord, that 
as we step out, you would reveal your plan, that you would reveal your presence, and that we would be people of faith that love you and honor you with our lives and are willing to go wherever you go and stay wherever you stay and move when you say to move. We love you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen.